talking about family life, God's way. And if the Lord will help us, we're going to talk about this for the next several weeks on Sunday night. Uh, biblical instructions that we must follow. If we're going to have a, a, a successful home life, then we've got to figure out what God's Word says about our home life. Amen? And then obey that. Uh, we looked at step one last week. Uh, remember in Ephesians chapter 5, before we get into the uh, uh, precise instruction for husbands, wives, parenting, children, he begins by telling us we've got to be filled with the Spirit. Amen? And... Um, that is the idea of not just a glass field, but that there's wind in our sails from the Lord, that God is directing us and working in our lives all the time. You can't have a Sunday religion and be filled with the Spirit. Uh, come to church and I get close to God. You've got to live right all week long. Say amen. That is so vital. And then he talks about corporate worship and private worship. I believe we are to worship God together. I also believe we are to worship God in our car. Uh, in, our, in our private times, God's Spirit should come and arrest you at different times. Amen. And then we ought to be thankful, giving thanks always for all things. You see, these things are the prerequisites to, uh, to having a good home life. Uh, folks, you, there is no formula for a good home life. You can't read a book out there and do these things and you'll have a happy home. Uh, but you can get right with God... Be filled with the Spirit, walk with the Lord, worship God, amen, and God will help you in your home life. Amen. Now look what we looked at last time, Ephesians 5, 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. The key to every relationship is submission. Did you hear that? The key to every relationship is submission. The word here for su subject or submit we'll find here. Is hupotasso. It's a Greek verb. It's compounded. Tasso means to arrange or to place in order. Hupo is under. It is to place someone under another. Uh, it's a military term. It means to place yourself under, to rank yourself under someone else. It is to rank yourself under those in authority over you, under those who have responsibility for you to be under someone. Now, tonight I want to look at some scripture from uh, 1 Peter. And Peter is writing to persecuted Christians with the goal in mind of encouraging them on how to live in the midst of a hostile society, how to conduct themselves in a world that is set against them. Uh, now listen to me. He, he says there's going to be three main social relationships we're going to deal with. Uh, put that up there. And the first one is simply uh, the government, our society as a whole. The second is the workplace. And the third is the family. Uh, and he's going to tell us in all three of these relationships, submission will be the key. If you're going to, if you're going to be a good citizen, you're going to have to learn to submit to some things. Well, it's so quiet in here. I love it. Praise God. You think I'm going to quit preaching, but I'm not. Amen. You see, if you're a Christian, you need to understand this. The only reason you've been left here is for an evangelistic purpose. You aren't here to build your kingdom. And by the way, I've been in some kingdoms in this world. they way overrated. I've sat in fancy cars. Way overrated. Amen. My little beat-up car just as fine. If the Holy Ghost is in there, it's twice as good. Say amen. I, I, God didn't leave you around so you can build yourself up. If you're here and you're a child of God, you have one purpose, and that is evangelistic in nature, to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Now, once we understand that, we'll understand that we're to make Christ known in our society. We're to make Christ known uh, in the workplace. We're to make Christ known in our family. The only reason we're here is to tell others about Jesus Christ. And if that is the case, and it is, then the key to me being a good witness is one word, and that's submission. Two of you love me, three of you are thinking about it. I can feel it. Amen. 1 Peter 2, 13, government, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors or as unto them that are sent by them for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well, 
For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Christian people are to submit to the authority set over them. I will tell you, friend, when one person in the so-called name of Christianity bombs an abortion clinic, he sets our cause back light years. Jesus did not tell us to blow up government buildings. He did not tell us to come against these things. He told us, to, folks, our kingdom's in heaven. Amen. Glory to God. Oh, I'm trying to be careful. Be careful, be careful that you don't miss the whole cause you're here for. We're not here to rearrange the world structure. What if you were in China today? What you going to do? What you going to change? Some of it's already there. It's already set up. There's nothing you're going to do to, 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 to change it one bit. You're going to have to live under it. Be light where you are. Be salt where you are. In your job. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. On your workplace, listen to me. On your workplace, you're to work hard for your boss. <laughs> Golly, that seems foreign for me to even have to say that. That Christians would have to hear, and I know you know these things. Well, my boss is a jerk. That's what Peter says. If he's a jerk, you still work hard for him. It doesn't change your responsibility because of his behavior or her behavior. Your job is to honor God in the work. And if they hire you to work, work. Folks, it is a shame and a disgrace, and the word of God is blasphemed when Christian people go to work and shirk off and don't do what they're supposed to and leave their job half done. It's an embarrassment to the name of Christ. Christians are to be the best workers at their job site. If they get rid of everybody, you are to be the last to go. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief and suffering wrongfully. Even if you have to go through stuff, if you've got to go through stuff to, to keep a good testimony, do it for the sake of the Lord. For what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. He said if you've done wrong and you get uh, lit into, that's one thing. And, and anybody can, can understand that. I did wrong, so I'm getting What if you do right and you still get grief? Right. See, here's our problem. We're more worried about our name than his name. We're more worried about what mine, how dare you say that to me? See, we're, we're, we're worried about us. We ought to be worried about Jesus. What are they going to think of the Lord if I act up and show myself? In one moment, you can ruin your testimony. In one moment, you can ruin your testimony. Friend, it is not worth it. Suffer the grief for the Lord's sake. Do what's right. Now, this is a happy message, isn't it? Praise God. Christ gave us the example, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled or insulted, he did not insult again. When he suffered, he threatened not. He committed himself to him that judges righteously. If you believe God's in charge, you can submit. But if you don't believe God's in charge, you better fight for your cause. You better go to battle for your stuff. But if you believe ultimately God is sovereign over all things, and if I do right, God will take care of me. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Preacher, why are you telling me all this? This is all leading up to the home life. Now, here's the first thing that, that Paul writes to the Ephesians about the home. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. 
It's the quietest I've ever heard it in this church. I've never heard it quite that quiet. Women didn't want to say anything, and men were scared to say stuff. I felt it. <laughs> Wives, <laughs> I want all the men to say praise God. praise God. I just want to know you're here, you bunch of chickens. Amen. <laughs> Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now listen, it's that same term of a military rank, of someone of a lower rank coming under someone of a higher rank, Submit yourself, come under their authority, your own husband. Now listen to me, every time this is asked of a woman, it's for your own husband. You're not to do this for any old man that comes along, but for your own husband, in your own home, you are under his headship. And you are, dear Christian lady, to submit yourself to his headship. Now, I want all the ladies to say amen. That was sad. Praise God. Colossians, Paul writes to these folks, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. The word fit there, anico in the Greek, is a word that means seemly, appropriate, correct, the right thing. This is not a cultural issue. It is not a transient issue. It is not a temporary issue. This is a God-ordained thing that the wife is to submit herself to her own husband. Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. This has nothing to do with spiritual inferiority. Women are just as equal in the eyes of God as men. Can be just as intelligent or more so. Don't look at your neighbor right now. Amen. Can have all types of gifts and blessings just like the man has. But in the role of the home, God commands the woman to place herself underneath the authority of her husband. We're not talking about spiritual things here. We're simply talking about divinely established categories of responsibility. And God has even fabricated us to fit those categories. Listen to me. Listen to me. God made the man physically stronger than the woman. I thought I'd get some kickback from that, but it's, uh, it's mostly true. I've seen some of these folks on television scare me just a tad, amen. But you know and I know on a normal basis, a man is physically stronger than a woman. It's the way God designed it. You can fight against it. You can rebel against it. You can flow him out of our society. Now they're saying they're going to send our ladies into combat frontline positions. Folks, I don't agree with that at all. I don't believe that God's word agrees with that at all. That's just people trying to make a point that there's no difference between men and women, but that is not the case. God made them male and female. He made them very different, the one from the other. Peter wrote and said this, Likewise, your husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. I'm glad my wife can't whoop me. You marry a strong woman if you want. I want a woman I can take down in the heat of battle. <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth. It, it, offend, it would offend me if she took me down or we arm wrestled. Bam! I, don't, I want my wife to be more tender than I am. I want her to be more soft-hearted and cry and, and, and have emotions that are maybe stronger and more tender than mine. That's how God designed her. Folks, this world and this culture has made our women into something they were never intended to be. And a lot of times it's because the man doesn't take his place. He becomes passive and weak and won't take leadership. Folks, leadership, <laughs> lead anything for a little while and see if you like it. Leadership is the most difficult thing in this life. And a man that won't take the headship, the, the leadership role, his poor wife has to come along and pick up the pieces and lead things because he won't. 
God never designed her to do that. Thank you. Amen. Peter says this. Now listen, remember he talked about uh, the government. He talked about uh, authorities there. He talked about employment. And now he says, likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. In the same way, you're supposed to be in subjection to the government. In the same way, you're in subjection to the, uh, your employer. Be in subjection to your own husband. Now listen to me. He's talking to a wife that's married to an unsaved person, an unsaved man. I want you to notice three things real quick that he doesn't tell her. He doesn't tell her to leave him. If you're married to an unbelieving man, God doesn't tell you to leave him. In fact, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 13 says, If he'll live with you, you live with him. You say, Preacher, I can't do it. You know what the Bible says? The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. What does that mean? That means the goodness and, and favor of God will roll off your saved companion onto you. There's been a lot of unsaved companions that have seen the favor of God rolling off their saved companion. Doesn't say leave your companion if they don't know the Lord. Number two, it says don't preach at him all the time. Don't leave notes, scripture notes on the bottom of his beer can. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Don't nag at him. Don't say, oh, you got to come to Folks, you will never win a man verbally uh, drawing him and trying to tell him what to do. If you haven't noticed yet, we don't like that. Thank you for two amens and one all right. Amen. Now, please, help me out down here. Help me out. Number three. Just look at this. That if they obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. The best chance a woman has to win her unbelieving husband is by submitting to him. Is by living right before God and submitting to his authority. I'm going to tell you something, ladies. You, you've got to know. You've got to know from the Word of God. The most important need your husband has is to feel respected. It ain't that we want it. It's that we need it. And when you undermine him, when you say, you lousy no good, you don't take care of us, you don't provide for us, you don't do this, you are killing him. And the moment you show him disrespect, you have lost his heart, and that's why the Word of God warns the husband, don't become bitter against your wife. Because there's many times a man has been disrespected so much he becomes bitter in his heart toward his wife, and the very one he's supposed to love, he no longer feels that love and affection toward. You say, preacher, what do I do with him? Respect him in spite of himself. It doesn't say if he deserves it. doesn't say if he's a great man. doesn't say if he's a great leader. It said do it because he's your husband. Well, it's true, yes. I got notes here, but I can't read them. Praise God. I... While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. What is that talking about? I believe it's talking about a pure life. Faithfulness. You know what a man needs? He needs a woman he knows is pure and is going to be faithful to him. He don't need a flirtatious wife. I don't believe in all that foolishness. I don't believe in going around batting your eyes at everybody you see. I don't believe in uh, flirty talk with other folks. I believe if they ain't your companion and they're under 90 years old, and don't smell like liniment, you are to be very careful. If they, if, they, if they smell of liniment, you can go ahead and take your grain no. off. Listen, I'm, te I'm telling you, wives, if you want to have an impact on your husbands, show him you are faithful to him, that you are pure, that your mind and your heart is right. Come on now. Don't you go, see, some, 
I'm a t- when we date, you know what we do when we date? We play games. <laughs> when you date, you play games, and you, and you say, well, you know, I, I, what were you doing? I tried to call you. Well, sisters, I mean sister, praise the Lord. <laughs> Not when you're dating, praise God. Susie dropped by the shop here and just wanted to say hi. It didn't mean, you, what you're doing is you're planting that, oh, someone's after me. You play games when you date. When you get married, you don't play games anymore. My wife's leaving has nothing to do with this sermon. <laughs> nothing to do with this sermon. You, <laughs> Jason, don't you infer anything from that happening. When you are married, the games are over. You don't act like you have any interest in anyone else or anyone else has any interest in you. And if someone does uh, do something out of the way, you ain't got to tell everything you know. I don't... I told you, I go home by Winthrop University, and during the summertime, maybe one of those co-eds is walking down the road. She came back in for this part. Look at here. She brought me some glasses. <laughs> oh, that fits great with my sermon. Maybe a pretty co-ed's walking down the road and crossing by the red light. Here's two things that are true. God, give me grace. I ain't looking. The Bible says you better not look at a a, a lovely person and and consider their beauty in your heart. That's step one. Some people say, well, you can look. It won't hurt. Yeah, you you read the Bible. Look in step one. Consider her beauty in your heart, step one, to trouble. So I've learned that my head is tied to my neck. And it's amazing. My neck's very, very sight. Look, watch. And I can just avert my head. Or look at here. Look how powerful I am. Watch my eyes. Isn't that something? So I have pretty good movement in my neck. My eyes can, you don't have to look where you shouldn't look all the time. But now listen to me. If that happened and she walked across, I don't go home to Kathy and say, well, the prettiest girl I ever saw walked in front of my car today. You know what you're doing? You're planting seeds of doubt and seeds of, of, of grief to your mate. Those are games. You don't play games when you're married. Listen to me, ladies. I'm just challenging you. Your man needs to know that you're pure and that you're faithful. Say amen, ladies. And I know you are. Now, please hear me. How many of the ladies know uh, I love you very much? Do you know that? In the right way. Praise God. (laughs) Oh, this is hard preaching. Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of the hair, the wearing of gold, or the putting on of apparel. Ladies, here's here's an issue, and you know this. If you're not careful, you can put too too much emphasis on that. Of, of, Of the clothes. Now listen to me, I believe everybody ought to do the best they can to take care of themselves. Say amen. I don't believe going around unkept is godly. I believe we ought to keep ourselves up. We ought to do the best we can, and we ought to be attractive to our mates. But I don't believe we should put all our emphasis on the outside. In fact, if you read the Bible, you'll find that in, uh, I think it's Isaiah chapter 3, God condemns the ladies of Israel for the, they put all the attention on their ornaments and their uh, decorations, and God said, I'm going to humble you down. I believe women are to dress with some modesty. Thanks, thank you for that. In 1 Timothy 2, 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Women are to dress modestly. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. Preacher, what do I do? Work on the inside. And that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, great price. Don't put all your attention on that. I'll lure him with uh, the the looks. And I'll lure Folks, the Bible says, take care of yourself. But it also says, get your heart and your life and your inside right with God. And I'll challenge you, if you're beautiful on the inside with God, you'll be attractive to your husband. Do you love me? Amen. Wives, listen, for after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, listen to me, this is not a, I've heard people say, well, Paul was just an anti-woman. That's foolishness. 
Paul says, wait a minute, way back in the Old Testament, this is how they lived. This has been God's doctrine all from the beginning. God has always wanted women to live this way, to be under subjection to their own husbands. Amen. Who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection under their own husband. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You know the story. Abraham told Sarah, we're going out. We're leaving hometown. We're leaving our family. Where are we going, Abraham? I have no idea. How many of you ladies would have enjoyed that conversation? You moving me away from mama? And you don't even know where we're going? Listen to your pastor. She obeyed him. She called him Lord. What does that mean? She put him as head over herself whose daughters ye are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. What does that mean? When you give your husband leadership in your home, you'll worry, what if it falls apart? What if everything goes to pieces? What if he don't take care of things? Your job's not to work. Your job's to obey God. Let God be God and God can take care of him. When Kathy and I first got married, she can tell you... Uh, I was terrible with finances. I just wrote checks until I, I thought as long as I had checks in my book, we were fine. The bank informed me otherwise. I bounced several checks on several occasions the first few months we was married. Poor Kathy, I didn't have insurance, and, uh, and I, I, a lot of things I just didn't do, and she probably thought, what have I got myself into? But you know what she learned to do? She learned to trust me. She learned to trust God. She learned to respect me. And you know what's happened through the years? God's totally changed me. I'm now in charge of all the finances. I know where all the monies are. I take care of all the insurances. She doesn't have to worry about that. I handle all of that for our family. You know why? Because I believe it's my job, it's my position as the provider for my home. Your job, ladies, is not to worry. Your job is to trust God, honor God, and submit to Him. And let God take care of your home. Everybody say amen. Do you love the Lord? Amen. I want you to stand.